right. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we really appreciate your patience with our technical difficulties. We were um, uh, talking in the background that we've gone 13 months with a number of state lands commission meetings and town hall events and uh, CEQA related um, outreach meetings. And this is our first technical difficulty. So I'm sorry it had to happen tonight, um, but I also feel grateful that we got through 13 months <laughs> without such an issue. Um, it's really great to see that we have such a large group of attendees tonight. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the State Lands Commission's Rincon Decommissioning Project Town Hall. I wanna first take a moment to acknowledge and honor the Chumash and Atataviam people on whose land, the island and the facilities we will be talking about this evening sit. We know that repairing our relationship with the land and the Chumash and Tataviam people requires action in addition to acknowledgement. And we intend to do just that. Native people have maintained a constant presence on the landscape for many thousands of years, and they are essential stewardship partners, whether along the coast, along our rivers and valleys, or in our fragile deserts. We thank the Chumash and Tataviam people for participating in this commission's activities and for their essential role in maintaining and adding to our state's rich cultural legacy. I wanna thank all of you for joining us virtually this evening, for taking the time to engage with us. We know that the last 13 months have been extremely stressful and overwhelming. And while there is an abundance of hope on the horizon with vaccinations progressing, improved medical treatments, schools reopening and economic relief assistance on the way and businesses beginning to open back up, we know that many of you are still experiencing trauma, exhaustion, stress and worry. Thank you for taking the time this evening to hear updates on the Rincon decommissioning project. We know your time and energy is valuable and we appreciate you being here with us tonight. You are currently viewing all of our panelists on what Zoom calls their gallery mode, like the game show hosts or game show Hollywood Squares. Using this view, I want to introduce our staff team. First, um, I would like to introduce Lane Lincecum, principal with Drill Tech and the commission's contractor. Simon Poulter, Principal with Padre Associates, the Commission's Consultant. Ann Bull with the University of California at Santa Barbara. Seth Blackman, our Chief Counsel. Pete Johnson, our Lead Engineer. Peter Reagan, our um, Co-Lead Engineer. Cindy Herzog, our Senior Environmental Scientist. Joe Fable and Michaela Weimer, both Senior Attorneys on the project. Mike Farina is our chief of our information services division and Katie Robinson Phillip is also an environmental scientist with our executive office. And calling in, you might not be able to see her is Sherry Pemberton, chief of our external affairs division. For the rest of the evening, we will be using the speaker view function of Zoom. So you will only be able to see the person speaking as part of the presentation. This will also enable you to view the PowerPoint presentations more clearly. Our agenda for the evening includes these opening remarks from me. And I just realized I forgot to introduce myself, I'm sorry. I'm Jennifer Lucchesi, the Executive Officer for the State Lands Commission. Lane Lincecum will be, provide a recap on the successful well plugging and abandonment phase of um, phase one of the decommissioning project completed to date. Simon Poulter will provide an overview of the next steps and what to expect during the phase two portion of the project which includes a feasibility assessment and analysis and CEQA review of the various options for the future disposition and use of the island, causeway, and onshore properties. We will conclude with comments and questions from all of you tonight. I will quickly share some instructions on how we can best participate in this meeting so that it runs as smoothly as possible. First, everyone, please make sure you have your microphones or phones muted to avoid background noise. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, you will need to do so in one of two ways. If you are attending on the Zoom platform, please raise your hand in Zoom. If you are new to Zoom and you joined our meeting using the Zoom application, click on the hand icon at the bottom of your screen. When you click on that hand, it will raise your hand. Second, if you are joining our meeting via phone, you must press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand to make a comment or ask a question. 
We will call on individuals who have raised their hands in the order that they are raised using the name they registered with or the last three digits of their identifying phone number. After you are called on, you will be unmuted and promoted as a panelist so that we can see you as you can share as you share your comments. Please also remember to unmute your computer or phone on your end. Please keep your comments respectful and focused. We will mute anyone who fails to follow these guidelines or at worst dismiss them from the meeting. And while these virtual meetings are becoming more routine, it's still a relatively new experience for most of us. And we appreciate your support and patience as we have learned already as we work together on this virtual platform. I wanna quickly just set the stage for tonight's town hall. As background, the State Lands Commission was created by the state legislature in 1938 to manage the state's sovereign tide and submerged lands, including the state's oil, gas, and mineral resources. The commission was given the authority and responsibility to manage and protect the natural and cultural resources on public lands in California. This includes leasing authority over the state's tide and submerged lands extending from the ordinary high water mark, or um, more commonly referred to as a mean high tide line, to three miles offshore. In 1969, the commission issued leases for the construction and operation of offshore oil and gas drilling and production islands and platforms. Now there are five offshore oil and gas production facilities, including Rincon Island under the commission's jurisdiction. These leases for these facilities and operations required and require the lessee to remove improvements as directed by the commission such as the production infrastructure and to restore the land to its natural condition. However, in this case, the sudden insolvency of the commission's lessee obligated the commission to assume control of the ring of Rincon Island and the onshore facility to permanently protect the public and the environment against an unintended release of oil or gas into the environment and on state lands. Rincon Island is within the California Coastal Sanctuary where new offshore oil and gas development is prohibited and cannot be leased absent an act of the California legislature. Specifically in 2017, Rincon Limited Partnership, a lessee of the state, state Lands Commission filed for bankruptcy hours before the State Lands Commission was scheduled to determine whether to find them in default and terminate their leases. This chapter 11 filing set off a cascade of events. Importantly, in December 2017, a court appointed chapter 11 trustee for the partnership quit claim the three offshore leases back to the commission. The partnership's insolvency and quit claims of their leases legally and practically shifted the responsibility to plug and abandon the 75 wells associated with these three leases and the facilities decommissioning um, efforts to the state. With that background, I will now turn it over to Mr. Lane Linsicum, who will provide a recap of the significant efforts that have occurred over the last couple of years in plugging the last um, 74 of the 75 wells associated with the offshore island and the onshore facilities. Lane? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, as just pr previously introduced, my name is Lane Linthicum, um, Chief Operating Officer of Drill Tech Incorporated, and also a project manager for the uh, Rincon Phase One Well Abandonment and Decommissioning Project. Um, <clears throat> a little background on Drill Tech: We're a California corporation established in 1989, uh, focused on engineering and project management. <clears throat> Tonight, I've got a few slides that uh, we're going to show. Um, to go over basically the project scope, project milestones, accomplishments to date, current operation status, and what we've got left uh, operation status, and what we've got left uh, as part of our scope of work. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. <clears throat> This slide shows a summary of our scope of work. First and foremost, we were hired to uh, safely manage the day-to-day uh, -day operations of these assets. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we were uh, tasked with maintaining federal and state compliance. It may not 
seem like much, but uh, of course, just because the facility is shut down doesn't mean there's not exposure to uh, releases or, or incidents. Rincon Island and the onshore leases are pretty unique uh, being in that they are in the water, they cross over to land, uh, cross over the 101, cross under the railroad tracks, and go to private minerals onshore. Uh, whenever uh, we started this project, I think we counted over 20 regulatory agencies that we uh, that had some form or fashion of jurisdiction over the uh, these assets. So that was a bit of a challenge at first, but. Uh, the state lands was very supportive in our efforts to maintain compliance and uh, you know, work through the, uh, the hurdles of uh, agency to agency uh, interaction. <clears throat> uh, that being said, uh, the biggest task of our project was to uh, design and execute the uh, plug in and abandonment of 75 wells. People may not also know it, but there are there's 25 wells located uh, onshore just to the north of the fire station at the sea cliff exit and there's 50 wells located offshore on Rincon Island. <clears throat> uh, in addition to the well abandonments, we um, <clears throat> were also tasked with removing any uh, you know facilities associated with the oil and gas production on the uh, the leases uh, covering the PRC 145, 410, and 1466. And finally, where we are today, uh, we're tasked with preparing the asset for caretaker status. Uh, in, in the simplest terms, uh, would define caretaker status as, uh, you know, eliminate any, any risks posed to the environment or the public. Next slide. Uh, this this slide shows some of our project milestones. Uh, in in summary, we we were awarded the uh, contract to do this work for state lands in July of 2018. We got started with the uh, plug in and abandonment of the onshore wells. A few months later, September 2018, uh, it took us about a year to plug and abandon 25 well 24 of the 25 wells. Onshore, we also uh, abandoned a couple of wells uh, on the parcel on the on the property for Calgym as well. So 20, uh, 26 wells in total have been abandoned onshore. Um, <clears throat> January 2019, we started the PA efforts on the island. So from, from September 18 to January, we were getting the island ready. Uh, people may not know a little background on. The, the island and the causeway, it was uh, in a little bit of a state of disrepair. The, the causeway, uh, when we started the project, was subject to 20,000 pound maximum loads across it. Just for reference, you know, a, a three quarter ton pickup weighs about 9,000 pounds. So, um, you know, with the truck and trailer, you we were able to move about 8,000 pounds of cargo across the, uh, the island. But as a part of our proposal for the abandonment uh, of the wells on the island, we, we uh, elected to use the causeway and we're able to do so. So that's six months from September to January took, you know, was preparation time there. Uh, there was also an extreme amount of corrosion uh, on, that had taken place on the island. Uh, you know, things hadn't, hadn't been maintained very well. And, uh, the, the island is in a constant state of wet and dry due to being so close to the ocean uh, and wellheads, the production equipment, the facilities, everything out there had an excessive amount of corrosion. And um, we had to do a little design work on some custom wellhead flanges to allow us to access these well bores and complete PA operations and maintain well control. <clears throat> so, anyways. Um, we got started with the uh, island January 2019. Um, we finished the, the onshore wells in August of 19, so that took about a year. Um, the, the offshore wells took two years. We finished those up in January of this year, 2021. 
Um, one of the one of the items noted on here is the uh, causeway repairs. So we ran into a little hiccup in December of 2019. We we found uh, during our monthly inspection of the causeway, we found one of the legs that was basically completely corroded in half. So uh, causeway traffic was suspended, and as I mentioned, that was our lifeline for PA operations. We we elected to. We thought that you know using the causeway was the safest and most efficient manner to get the abandonments done. So we were not set up for marine operations. Um, so we started some emergency repairs on the causeway in January, and um, that evolved into a uh, little more robust structural upgrade that started in June and was completed in December of 2020. We are set to. PNA the final well, uh, which is our injection well onshore this month. And um, we anticipate that everything will be in caretaker status by the end of our contract in June. Next slide, please. As I mentioned on the previous slide, if you uh, can see this slide deck, the, uh, the video, the picture in the Upper left corner is the pile that we found in uh, that was on December 18th. Um, so that's how we found it. Uh, the picture on the top right is the installation of the repair sleeve. And uh, so that enabled us to get back to work uh, without having to take a boat ride out of Ventura Harbor. Uh, some of the, uh, this slide shows some of the statistics good perspective on the, the work that was undertaken. As discussed, we have uh, we abandoned 74 wells so far. Um, we placed over 10,000 barrels of cement in those wells. Uh, we upgraded a th roughly 1,000 feet of the causeway. And um, in our other efforts, we've, we've removed uh, 41 miles of tubing, 190 tons of casing cut and recovered out of the wells, and uh, over 400 tons of steel recycled. In addition to this, we've uh, we've recycled over 3,000 tons of concrete. That was from the uh, mainly from the the wells onshore, uh, which were started construction uh, in the 1920s. So those wells were originally drilled and completed on the beach before the 101 was built, and they kind of just layered concrete on, like Rome. So uh, a lot of concrete for 25 wells, but. Everything has uh, been removed and plugged and flat ground now. <clears throat> uh, everything we accomplished was without incident. And um, I've mentioned some of the other challenges we had uh, earlier on, the, the, uh, the, ca the causeway, the corrosion. Uh, in addition to that, you know, we had to work with a, uh, work through the smoke of the Thomas fire and, uh, you know, the subsequent mudslides that kept the 101 closed for several months north of us. And then obviously most recently, uh, COVID. So I'm happy to say that so far, knock on wood, we haven't had any work-related uh, cases of COVID. And uh, we were able to continue with our abandonment operations safely and efficiently. And uh, as of right now, we're still on track and plan on maintaining that track to stay ahead of schedule and under budget. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Current status of operations. Uh, the, the two pictures on this slide can kind of show you where we were and where we are. Uh, the slide on the left shows the island under well p a operations in september of last year and uh, the picture on the right shows where we were a few weeks ago as you can see i tried to outline these items in in color coded so i could speak to them so uh starting on the the, the left side you've got in, in red outlined as uh, the well bay that's an area that's where all 50 wells on the island were housed as you can see on the right outline it's uh the wells have all been capped They've all been submitted to, to the base of the cellar, which was approved by CalGym and uh, cut, cut and capped. 
and uh, we're in the process of removing that well bay now and the back wall uh, that was viewed as a uh, potential nuisance and hazard for, for anybody that might be trespassing on the island. Uh, in the blue outline, we've got uh, all of our well abandonment equipment on the left. You can see the rig out there, uh, blowout prevention equipment, wireline unit, uh, forklift, pumps, mud mixing equipment, cementing equipment. All of that has since been removed, as you can see on the right. Uh, we got a little bit of dirt, earth moving equipment out there that's uh, helping us with the with the well bay wall and things, but. Um, all of the well abandonment equipment has been removed. And then finally, in the uh, yellow outline, you've got the tank battery. Uh, as you can see from the picture on the right, that's gone. So uh, most of the, we've removed most of the oily, uh, oily associated equipment. There is a few sumps on the island that we're in the process of steam cleaning. And uh, those will be filled in as per our uh, Coastal Development uh, De Minimis Waiver. I think that's all I've got on that one. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so where we are now, where we have to go, uh, as you could, you saw by the last picture, we the well bay wall removal is not complete. Um, the tank farms are pretty much there. We have, uh, there was, there was also I believe 15 tanks on the onshore lease that have been removed all except for uh, eight foot of the last one, which we're in the process of solidifying right now. So uh, we've got to finish our tank farm removal. We are like, a, like, a, like you saw in the previous picture, the well bay wall, um, that's where we're working right now. We're probably more than 80% complete with the removal of that. And um, so we, like I mentioned, we've just got to fill a few uh, fill a few sumps on the island and continue cleaning up a few small items. <clears throat> uh, we've also uh, recently completed our phase two soil and groundwater assessment on the onshore leases. Uh, we drilled several core holes and also uh, several water monitoring wells. We've collected all the data from those wells for our round one analysis and are waiting on some of the uh, sample results. Um, <clears throat> what we've got left to do is uh, mainly we've got to fix the causeway fence. We're going to do some security upgrades on the island to uh, protect the asset and also protect the public and the environment. And um, there's a few buildings that we'll remove. The, the buildings for the onshore leases will also be removed. And as you can see by this picture on the right, uh, there's, there's two other buildings that are on the island that will be removed also. So uh, as previously mentioned, we're going to try to leave everything in a uh, safe position for, for the next phase of the project, which Simon will speak to. But also, this is all, all of our work that is currently being undertaken is based on uh, a de minimis waiver from the Coastal Commission and a uh, zoning clearance from Ventura County. That's all I've got on that one. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, I added these links on here. If anyone's interested, they could read a little bit more about the project, or I'm sure there's uh, the state lands can provide information as well. Um, you know, I'd like to also take this time to thank the state lands for the opportunity to conduct this work and uh, say that. I'm very proud of the accomplishments of, of the team, everyone included, and uh, you know, also say that it would not have been a success without the support of the state lands, uh, all of the uh, agencies involved, and also the Muscle Shoals community. Appreciate you guys uh, putting up with us for the last three years. And that's pretty much all I have. Great, thank you so much, Lane. Um, and as um, we introduce um, Simon Poulter from Padre Associates, um, our consultant for phase two of this project, I do just want to um, elevate and highlight um, 
Lane's work and his team's work on this phase one portion of the project over the last couple of years. This is essentially a huge state public works project. And I think it's important to acknowledge um, that uh, we, with the leadership of Drill Tech um, and their um, comprehensive approach to this entire project came in um, ahead of schedule and under budget, which is a really significant achievement um, for a state project of this magnitude with the amount of risk um, involved. So um, we are just so uh, thankful and pleased um, with the uh, success of the phase one portion. And we have all confidence that the next phase will be just as successful. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Simon Poulter with Padre and Associates, um, and he will be um, providing an overview on what to expect in the phase two portion. Simon, take it away. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, could I have the first slide, please? Jennifer, uh, could I have the first slide, please? As uh, Lane indicated, uh, Padre will be picking up the baton from Drill Tech to start the second phase of the work, which is going to be looking at not the wells, but really the physical facilities that are associated with the Rincon Island offshore facility and the onshore hub lease uh, located next to 101. Uh, as part of our team, we have brought together, well, first of all, Padre uh, will be leading the effort. We are a Ventura headquartered environmental consulting firm. Um, We've been involved in numerous local projects as well as statewide, uh, which I'll, I'll touch on a few later on. We're gonna be supported by a number of other firms, including Longitude 123, another Ventura-based uh, engineering and, and um, construction management firm who's probably the premier um, and most experienced marine demolition contractor in the state of California. And it's great to have them as part of our team. We'll also be uh, continuing to use the resources of uh, Drill Tech to help support um, their understanding of the island and the onshore facilities. We're also adding UCSB to our team as part of our biological resource assessment, and you will hear a, a little bit more from them uh, later in this presentation. We also have uh, a coastal engineer um, who will do an analysis of potential uh, impacts should the island uh, be changed, removed, uh, uh, you know, basically coastal process issues and uh, support from uh, ZM associates for some air quality work, which is always a big issue with large uh, demolition projects if, if that was to happen. Next slide, please. Um, for those of you who've lived in the area, um, you, you've probably seen other decommissioning projects that have occurred in the area. Probably the most uh, notable was the 4-H platform abandonments, which occurred off of Carpinteria and Summerlin. These were the, the first real decommissioning projects in the state of California. State Lands was the lead agency uh, involved in that. Um, and you know, obviously, a lot of uh, experience brought to, to bear. In the immediate area, the Seacliff Piers um, were a, peer of, a pair of oil and gas production piers that were located immediately adjacent to the onshore facility uh, for Rincon. You can see Rincon Island in the background in the picture in the upper portion of this slide. Those uh, uh, wells and the associated pier structures were removed about 20 years ago in this site. And obviously uh, that information is, is very helpful in, in developing our understanding of the uh, issues that we may be facing with the island and the causeway. More recently, the Grubb uh, lease uh, CRC property um, located just north of Ventura um, was completed just this past year by Longitude 123, the removal of some intake in, and outfall structures associated with oil and gas uh, production there in the, in, in the Ventura area. The picture to the right or the bottom of this slide is Belmont Island, and this is really the only other analogy we have to a similar structure of an offshore island being de decommissioned. This island was decommissioned about 15 years ago offshore of Seal Beach. Um, it was a little different than what we're looking at at uh, Rincon because it was a, uh, a caisson versus a, a, an island built up on sand and rock, but it did provide us a, a lot of lessons learned. Um, both Longitude and Padre were heavily involved in, in these projects. And then the last project uh, and notable is, is Bird Island decommissioning. Um, 
that is off of the platform Holly area where the Elwood decommissionings are currently being planned. Uh, again, another notable local decommissioning project that uh, involved uh, the State Lands Commission and a lot of other resource agencies in the area. And we're drawing upon that experience from them. Next slide, please. The phase two work is going to involve two components. One is a feasibility study and the other is a CEQA component. And I'm going to mainly focus on uh, the feasibility study tonight since that is our, our, our primary task um, in the next six months. And this study is basically going to help us understand, A, how the island was put together, what is its current condition, and what are the potential um, ways that we can address uh, either the continued use of the facility, um, the reuse of, of, of some components, or ultimately if, if any of the components need to be removed. Longitude, uh, working with some of their subconsultants, are going to be preparing a desktop study, which looks at all the existing plans and documents. We found some very interesting documents about how the island was built, where the source material was, uh, working with drill tech on their understanding of how things have been uh, changed out there since the island was originally constructed. We'll also be involved in looking at many of the resource issues around the island. If we go to the next slide, I, I'm a very visual person, so I tend to go with flow diagrams and uh, I tend to throw these up and everybody looks at them and nods their heads. But this really talks about the process I just described where we're going to be looking at individual components, putting together some preliminary alternatives, providing that information to both the state lands as well as the general public as we go through this process to kind of look at what are the alternatives that could be ultimately developed here at this site or you know, is removal really the best thing to do? So this, this flow diagram kind of gets us where we'll end up producing a final feasibility report that will allow us to discuss that. To support this effort, as outlined in our next slide, um, we're gonna be doing some very site-specific studies out on the, um, uh, out on the uh, area. Next slide, please. One of them has already started and has been partially completed, which is a geophysical survey around the entire island and causeway. That will involve basically mapping the seafloor. Um, we're also looking at the uh, vertical structure sticking out of the water of the island and the causeway so that we can see under the water what things look like. How has the island weathered uh, the many years that it's been out there? Is there any uh, issues that we need to be, to be involved with um, in, our, in our analysis? Another study which is also underway is uh, using Milton Love, Ann Bull, and Mary Nishimoto um, from UCSB, some of the premier scientists uh, from um, UCSB on uh, the use of artificial structures uh, and the studies of the uh, wildlife that lives around them, uh, mainly fish and, and invertebrates. And we'll uh, touch on their work uh, near the end of my presentation. As I noted, we're also going to be looking at, how, you know, how is the structural integrity of the island going under the current sea state conditions, recognizing sea level rise, we'll need to see how the island is doing as far as can it withstand, uh, you know, many years of storms and, and changing sea levels. And we're also extending into the soil and water assessment work in the island, um, working with drill tech to understand what, if any, uh, contamination exists within the island itself. We are working with them to complete that assessment also in the onshore facility. Knowing that this was an oil and gas facility, this is always one of the things you need to confirm. Next slide, please. I've used this uh, term, the three R approach, which is removal, reuse, and reefing. And this is really where we are starting to look at what are the opportunities for the potential um, final disposition of the island. Is it really going to be removed Will we reuse it? Are we going to reef it? The picture here um, is actually Belmont Island as it was being removed and the riprap that was located around that. In this situation, the state lands working with uh, Padre at the time uh, and the, the owner of the island, Exxon Mobil, did an extensive research on, uh, on should, the, should this island be turned into a reef? And this allowed us to do a lot of studies working collaboratively with them 
and looking at ways that we could reuse some of the facilities. And in this case, the rock from Belmont Island was moved further offshore into an existing reef site. So we're looking at a variety of alternatives and you will see these kind of repeated through the course of our presentation tonight, as well as ultimately the feasibility study of what pieces of this uh, facility may or may not be uh, useful moving forward. Next slide, please. As promised, I have another diagram. So taking that concept from the feasibility study, we will actually be moving into the CEQA phase. And again, we'll be working with the public and uh, all of the agencies, including state lands to identify, okay, if we go down a certain path, whether it be leave things as they are or remove the island completely, what do we need to do to address what those impacts might be? And, uh, and again, start the CEQA process and develop a document that can both inform the public and the decision makers on what the potential outcome is if you do a certain activity. Next slide, please. For those of you who are familiar with the California Environmental Quality Act, you'll, you'll recognize many of the issue areas that we need to address when we do a CEQA document. But basically, we'll be going through the biological, the, the geological, and social cultural issues that may be uh, impacted by either retaining the island or removing it, or ultimately the reuse. And this will include those issues such as social economic impacts to commercial fishermen, environmental justice, uh, Native American communities um, through that process. But this really is the second phase. The first phase that we're working on now, the feasibility study will really be done to develop what kind of alternatives we'll take into that CEQA document. The bullets kind of outline some of the key steps that we typically uh, undertake when we do a, a CEQA document. Next slide, please. Public input is gonna be extremely important throughout this um, second phase of the, of the planning for Rincon Island. This town hall meeting is really the start of that process. We are going to be soliciting a lot of input from people who know the site and have potential interest in seeing it either developed into a, another site we recognize that the island has tremendous biological value, the, 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 the marine birds that use it, the pelicans, there is an osprey that uh, is often out there. We also will show you what we found um, below the water surface around the island. During the feasibility study, we will have meetings to further define the scope of what we're looking at, working with our contractors. Um, we will have a draft feasibility study that everybody will be able to review and provide comments and ultimately a decision um, when we make the start the, the CEQA document of what of the alternatives that are identified in the feasibility study actually need to be done in that. So this is going to be a very active and intensive public involvement process. Now, to end my presentation, I'm actually going to turn um, the slideshow over to Ann Bull with UCSB who has prepared a short video of documenting some of the dive surveys they've done around the island. And I think all of you will find this very enjoyable. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Ann Bull. I'm with the Marine Science Institute at UC Santa Barbara. And my group is, as Simon has said, working to provide marine biological information to the team at State Lands. Um, we looked into some literature and found that the most good evening everyone i'm ann bull i'm with the marine science institute at uc santa barbara and my group is as simon has said working to provide marine biological information to the team at state lands um, we looked into some literature and found that the most recent underwater survey of Rincon Island was performed over 40 years ago in um, the mid 1970s. And we took an early opportunity then to send UC divers out to the island for initial reconnaissance. And we were surprised by the unique nature of the place and what we saw. So we have put together a short video of the marine life and habitat to show you tonight. Um, Mike, if you'll start the video, I'll voice over. We don't have any music, so I'll voice over. This is Rincon Oil Island. This is what you see when you're going to dive.
what we're seeing here are large growths of coral and algae and macrocystis kelp. Big schools of sargo, there's some perch in there, some blacksmiths, more kelp, very um, extensive and healthy macrocystis growths um, at the island. One of the things that we saw at the island were um, a, an iconic species known all uh, parts of California and Baja are Gorgonians or sea fans. They're a classic I, iconic species that are associated with the island. Here's a great many um, of these Gorgonians being filmed for size and species uh, by our divers. These Gorgonians are soft corals. They are colonial soft corals. These are two different species. This is called the golden Gorgonia, it's Mauricia. Um, very classic Southern California species. And, and it turns out that that these species are very iconic to shallow nearshore California, but it's rare to see them in such prolific numbers. On all four species, we found all four species at Rincon. This is a female uh, sheep's head. And if there's a female sheep's head here, that means there are male sheep's head here. There's a kelp bass, probably one of the most sought after recreational fish in Southern California. Here's a female sheep's head again. But behind her is another iconic uh, near shore species, species in California lobster. So Panelurus, the spiny lobster. And here's the state saltwater fish, the Garibaldi. Another classic California important species is the horn shark. The tetrapods and some of the rocks on the islands have created big open caves and tucked away areas for animals to shelter in. Here's more filming of the kelp beds at a different location on the island. There's a coral and algae, which is the purple and pink. There was a senorita fish. Very well established kelp beds here. And the turf on the bottom, it's long and it's swaying in the, cam in the surge for the camera. That's coral and algae, very common. It's our chief diver, Scott Clark. Uh, wrapping up the transect tapes. And I believe this is Caitlin, uh, one of our divers with the camera and the jig used to size the camera. Okay, I think that's it for the video. Uh, we also took time to look at a nearby surrounding areas both up coast and down coast from the island for comparative evaluation. The island sits, uh, the marine biology populations and, and uh, vertebrates and invertebrates, it sits within an extensive sand shield area that has nothing comparable to the island habitat or the island structure. So certainly Rincon Island represents a unique habitat within its locale. And at first look, our first look at this island and our fish counts and IDing some of the um, invertebrates, it may also be a biodiversity hotspot within this low diversity environment. So thank you. Back to you, Jennifer. Thank you.
it looks like Jennifer may have fallen off. So we'll have to kind of continue on from there until she joins back up. She's coming back around. Um, while she's coming back on, is there anything else that any of our panelists would like to say today uh, that we've not already covered? All right, well then I think what we can plan to do here as we wait for Jennifer is that uh, as folks, hey Jen, you're back. Hi, I'm sorry, my internet is unstable. <laughs> That's the note I, I just got, so I apologize. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. It's back to you, um, Ann and Simon had finished and we were just getting ready to see if there was anything else anybody else had to say or any closing remarks you had before we move into public comments or questions. Excellent, thank you. I think that we are ready to move into um, public comment and questions. That's what we're here for. So just a couple of quick reminders. Um, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment, um, you can do so in one of two ways. You can raise your hand in Zoom. That's That um, icon is at the bottom of your screen. And when you click on that hand icon, it will raise your hand. If you're joining our meeting by phone, you can press star nine on your keypad to raise your hand to ask a question or make a contact a comment. We will call on individuals who have raised their hands in the order that they are raised using the name they registered with or the last three digits of their identifying phone number. After you are called on, you will be unmuted and promoted as a panelist so that we can see you and you can see us as you share your question or comments. I also um, failed to mention earlier that we do have activated our question and answer function in Zoom. So if you are um, participating via the Zoom platform and would prefer to ask your question um, in written form, you can do so at the bottom of your screen using the Q&A function. We will do our best to answer all questions tonight um, submitted um, in writing or verbally. Um, but if we don't know the answer, we'll let you know and we will follow up with you. Um, so with that, if you have any questions or comments, please raise your hand. And Katie, feel free to call on um, the hands that are being raised now. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, so for the first hand raised, we have Jordy Scully. Hi, Jordy. Um, please um, feel free to ask a question or make a comment. Hi, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, I was just wondering, um, Sorry, I'm a bit new to this. So how many phases are there? So after phase two, what would happen? And I'd also like to ask, how, um, how do you all determine who are working on these projects? And how can we determine it for the other um, decommissioning projects in the future? Thank you. Of course, thank you for your question and thank you for participating tonight. So um, there are a total of three phases. Um, the third phase is the actual implementation of the commission's action on the um, ultimate disposition um, and potential reuse of the island and the onshore facilities. So phase two really encompasses um, re the really in-depth um, and publicly um, public engagement oriented analysis a portion where we're looking at the feasibility of um, the ultimate disposition of the island and the onshore facilities going through the CEQA process and the commission making the ultimate decision on how to move forward. Um, and then phase three will be the actual physical effort of moving forward, including um, if there is the decision to um, remove the island or any kind of state sponsored activity or improvements um, seeking the uh, requisite uh, budget request through the state process um, associated with that. Um, in terms of um, your question about how we identify who works on these projects, I'm assuming you're asking about our consultants and our contractors, and we follow um, the state's uh, competitive bidding process associated with these types of projects. Um, and so we went through that, um, that competitive process and ended up retaining Drill Tech and Padre and their subcontractors through this. I hope that answers your question. And you're, you're still um, you're still able to engage with us if you have follow ups. Oh, sorry. Yes, that answered my question perfectly. Thank you so much. Yes, of course. Thank you. Hey, 
for the next hand, we have Pamela Warden. Good evening, Pamela. Good evening. Um, I wanted to just uh, comment on Drill Tech and Lane and his team. They have been extremely, extremely involved in our community. They are the best neighbors we've ever had. And that every person there, anytime I've gone to Lane with a concern or to Roger or anyone, it's been taken care of. I'm hoping that Padre is hearing my comment because this community, although we look kind of quiet, um, do not like to be invaded where it is changing our form of living. And so uh, we wanna be involved. Uh, we are involved and we are vocal if we're not involved. So I would like to just again commend Drill Tech and I hope that our relationship with Padre will be as good because uh, we are sorry to see Drill Tech go. Thank you, Pamela, for that comment. We couldn't agree with you more about Lane and his team and Drill Tech overall. Um, they have been an ideal contractor uh, for the commission and the state as a whole. Um, and um, as Simon mentioned during his presentation, he will be um, drawing on Lane and his team's expertise through the phase two portion. Um, so drill tech won't be going far. Um, and um, I want to assure you um, that um, Simon and his team and his subcontractors are well equipped and skilled um, to engage very comprehensively and meaningful with you and your uh, colleagues and the rest of the stakeholders um, in and outside Ventura County and the region. So we look forward to that engagement. This is frankly, um, I'm, I'm going to sound like a nerd here, but this is frankly um, the fun part of our job is to um, now that the uh, riskiest part is just about concluded and we're looking at, okay, what do we do with these facilities and this island and the onshore facilities. This is where the great ideas come out and we can work with all of those that are interested and have a stake in what the future looks like offshore here. So thank you for your engagement and um, we hope to be talking to you and everyone else a lot in the future. Thank you very much. Yeah. Katie, are there any other hands raised? Um, thank you, Jen. At this time, we don't have any hand ra hands raised, but we do have a few questions in the Q&A, so I can begin reading those out if we'd like. Yeah, that would be great, and then we can identify who's best to answer that, those questions. So go ahead, Katie. That'd be great. So for the first question we have from Schaff, has it been determined that Rincon Island is or is not a historic resource under CEQA? I would like to actually um, turn this over to Simon. Um, to answer um, to the extent he can, because this will be something that's explored during the CEQA process. Yes, any, uh, any of us who are over 50 years old know that <laughs> we could potentially be a, a, a historic resource, but no, that determination has not been made at this point. It will be part of the scope of work. Thanks, Simon. Katie, can we move on to the next question, please? Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is from Jose Bacallo. When will public comment period for the CEQA documents begin and how long will the public have for the comments? Great, um, so we, um, I want to just highlight and emphasize that we actually have a whole public engagement process that happens before the CEQA process begins. Um, and that is um, founded around the work that we're doing um, uh, in assessing the feasibility of the options, um, ranging from complete removal of the island to reuse in some way or another. And um, that feasibility study that um, will be greatly informed by public engagement along with all the science um, and data um, assessment studies that Simon and Anne referenced um, will be used to help inform that feasibility assessment and ultimate determination about what the options are to be studied under CEQA. So um, we have not gotten to the point in the CEQA process of how many days um, will be allowed for public comment. Um, that will be determined as we move forward, but um, I want to assure you that our 
whole purpose in beginning the talent um, with uh, the whole purpose with this town hall event and many more that will come is um, to really solicit information, comments, perspectives, insights, ideas from all of you um, so that our feasibility study is um, has the utmost integrity and is as comprehensive as we can make it. So um, uh, just a little highlight into my conclusionary, my conclusion remarks is um, stay tuned for further updates on how you can engage with us and how we'll be engaging with you as we embark on the feasibility um, portion of phase two. Katie, next question, please. Yes, the next question is from Steve. Could you show a map of the onshore land involved? Um, we will work on that while we address the next question. So I'll, um, I'm tagging my team <laughs> to um, maybe provide Mike with a copy of that map that we can share um, when it's available. Katie, the next question, please. Yes, the next uh, question is from owner. During feasibility study, is community input taken? Please provide an organization chart of various consultants under Padre. Padre referenced the decision makers, who are they? Um, why didn't UCSB study the marine life under the causeway and is it substantial? And when the Sea Cliff Pier complex or oil piers was demo demoed, a new reef was designed but never installed to restore the surf that was lost due to removal of the oil piers. Those are all great questions. So I'll take a stab at the first couple and then I'll turn it over to Simon and Anne who can maybe answer the last two questions. Um, so, um, as I previously mentioned, community input is definitely taken and we need it. It's necessary for us to actually have a very meaningful feasibility study. So, like I said before, please engage with us and we'll ensure to engage with you. Um, in terms of the organization chart of the various consultants, um, we probably can't provide that tonight on the spot, but we will certainly uh, provide that on our website um, for full transparency. And pa um, Padre reference decision makers. Um, I'll let Simon clarify if I get this wrong, but the decision makers in terms of the ultimate disposition of the island and the onshore facilities is the State Lands Commission. The State Lands Commission is a three member um, commission. Their members are the Lieutenant Governor, Lieutenant, currently Lieutenant Governor um, Eleni Kunalakis, the State Controller, who is currently uh, State Controller Betty Yi, and the Director of Finance um, uh, appointed by the Governor. And that uh, the current Director of Finance um, is uh, Keely Bosler. So our commission um, meets in public uh, every two months, making decisions on um, the use um, and protection of over 4 million acres of state lands and resources throughout the state, onshore and offshore. Um, and so it's a very transparent tr commission. Um, and when the decision on the ultimate disposition of these properties are made, you will be well aware um, through public noticing and events like this um, with ample opportunity, not just to speak to our team, our staff team and consultants, but also to address the commissioner, the commissioners themselves on your thoughts on their decision um, for, the, for these operations moving forward. Simon, I'll turn it to you for the next couple of questions. Okay, and yes, I was just referring to the, the commissioners themselves as, as the ultimate de decision makers. Um, and I'm gonna be embarrassed to say that I forget the next question. <laughs> um, so it's written, I'm not sure if you can see it under the Q&A function. Um, the next questions are, why didn't UCSB study the marine life along the causeway? Is, um, it is substantial. When the Sea Cliff Pier Complex or the oil piers, uh, yes. demo, do you see them now? Yes, okay, thank you. Great. Yeah, uh -huh. and I'll, I'll I'll defer to Anne on the on the pier. Um, but as far as Sea Cliff, there was no um, final mitigation put in place for um, restoration of any surf break that was um, discussed during that process. Um, I will note that there was some concrete debris from the caissons themselves that were left in place as, um, uh, as fish habitat, but um, there really was no requirement based on the final review of the coastal development permit and the state lands approval process of the document for a surf reef at that site. 
although I know there have been numerous attempts to actually build a reef there. And I'll defer to you on the uh, biological resources along the, the wharf site. Um, first, I want to say that though I work in Santa Barbara County, I live in Ventura County. And my husband uh, is born in Ventura County. So he's a county uh, native. And he and his family during the 50s and late 40s had a cabin out in Punta Gorda uh, area, which is where Rincon is now. Um, and uh, used to go out there during the summertime. So it's kind of closer to home. Uh, well, I didn't say that we didn't study the causeway and we have. We took um, still photographs at two different elevations on the submerged sections of the pilings. Uh, we didn't have any, what I would say uh, was a substantial video to, to stick into my presentation, but we're not done studying it yet. So we will be going back and uh, we need to be cognizant when drill tech or latitude 123 is going to be working out there we have to be careful where we're working on that causeway side because that's also the side with the boat landing. So we don't really wanna be around that area when they're working around it. Well, we have already been out there and we will continue uh, to be out there. If you have any further information about it, um, please get it to Simon and he'll get it to us, thanks. Thank you, Anne. Um, Simon, did you have anything to add? No, um, you know, obviously, as we compile all of the information, both historical and the current studies, we will, you know, make sure that, the, that we address all of those kind of biological issues. I mean, in addition to the subsurface biological issues, we are looking at the bird and, and marine mammal use on and around the island. Great, thank you. Um, I think at this point, we are going to try to share our screen so we can show a map of the, um, of the onshore and offshore op, um, facilities um, and just to give everybody a little bit of orientation. And well, thank you. Um, I think at this point, we are going to try to share our screen so we can show a map of the, um, of the onshore and offshore op, um, facilities. Um, and just to give everybody a little bit of orientation. And while we're doing that, we'll move on to the next couple of questions. Um, and, uh, and then if there's questions that arise based on this map, we, are, um, uh, we will come back to that. Um, let's see. Um, the next couple of questions have to do with the ex um, expected timeline for the feasibility study phase two and phase three. Um, so um, I will take a stab at this and then Simon and Cindy, you can correct me <laughs> or provide additional context. Um, we're looking at about six months um, for the feasibility study um, to be um, uh, conducted and completed, that will then inform the CEQA process. And the CEQA process can take as long as 12 to 15 months if an EIR is determined um, to be required. Um, so we're looking at for the phase two um, process, you know, as little as two years, maybe longer. Um, again, um, the State Lands Commission's primary objective um, through this phase two process is to um, engage with um, the community, Muscle Shoals, the greater Ventura County community, and all the stakeholders that have an interest in this uh, to the greatest extent possible. Um, so it's um, as meaningful as we can make it um, to help inform the decisions by the commissioners. Um, so uh, to that extent, we'll take the time we need um, so that we, are, uh, um, we can um, meet that primary objective. In terms of phase three and any kind of future physical um, uh, changes that might occur out there or future uses, that's really going to be, the timeline associated with that is gonna be dictated by a couple of different things. One is the results of the feasibility study and the CEQA analysis, obviously, and the, um, and the decision by the commission. 
if any decision by the commission requires state funding, um, we will have to go through the state process to secure that funding. Um, similarly, if there if there's a um, potential for reuse, um, then we will be working with the um, appropriate parties um, to uh, evaluate that specific reuse, including negotiating leases and that sort of thing. So phase three um, at this point, because we're just beginning phase two is a little ambiguous for even us as we think about timing and timelines. Um, but as we start to crystallize that, as we learn more through the feasibility and SQL analysis, we will be sure to share that if we have any further um, clarity. Um, uh, Simon or Cindy, do you have anything to add or correct? <laughs> No, that, that, that timing as you outlined is, is exactly what we're looking at. At least uh, the feasibility phase, we're anticipating completing um, within the next six months, there will be a draft document as well as a final document for public to review and have input in. Okay, great, thank you. Katie, do you wanna read the next question? Um, maybe uh, with the timeline of 634? Yes, uh, so one attendee has asked, based on the way that the wells have been plugged and the island has been decommissioned, are there any major restrictions on the island's use going forward? Um, so there possibly could be, and I'll, again, I'll defer to Simon if he knows of any off the top of his head, but I want to emphasize that that's exactly why we're embarking on the feasibility study, um, to really be able to methodically and systematically go through um, that uh, effort to identify any major restrictions um, for the island um, or the onshore facility. Simon, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, um, you know, we will um, be working with Longitude and, and uh, a, a engineering, another venture, a local engineering firm, Thomas and Beers, who's associated with uh, Longitude to do a complete structural review and making sure that there's nothing associated with either the island or the causeway that would restrict future use, or if there is restrictions, what it would take to potentially re repair those. Um, I I'll defer to lane on the wells, but they have been abandoned in, in accordance with the requirements of state law and CalGEM and state land requirements. So they, they should be uh, not a restriction on the future use of the, the, the island. But um, obviously we need to look at, at the structure itself and make sure it can withstand another 50, 100 years, whatever might be the life expectancy. Great, thank you. Lane, do you have anything to add to that? No, uh, outside of what Simon said, the, the wells have been plugged and abandoned in accordance with current CalGEM regulations. And um, I don't see the, the wells themselves preventing any kind of specific future use. Excellent, thank you. Katie, do you, would you like to move to the next question, please? Yes, thank you. The next question is from Ray Harmon. How much will you be asking to sell the island? <laughs> That's a good question too. So we will not um, be selling the island. We are actually the state and including the State Lands Commission is um, constitutionally prohibited from selling the island um, or the land underlying the island. Um, there is a state constitutional prohibition on the selling of tied and submerged lands. Um, so we won't be selling the island. Um, if the commission decides that um, it would like to keep the island intact and um, explore options for reuse, um, the mechanism for um, effectuating that reuse would likely be through a lease document. And the commission currently manages about 3,600 leases throughout the state from everything from you know oil and gas platforms offshore to marine oil terminals to uh, recreational um, private piers in Huntington Harbor. So uh, our leasing portfolio is quite diverse and wide ranging. Um, and I suspect any potential reuse, um, that will be something we'll be able to, to manage and handle moving forward. Katie, the next question. Yes, the next question is from Dan Riddick. Concerning the oil pier removal impact on the surf that may happen in Muscle Shoals, how do we become assured about the follow through? 
Well, I, I suspect and I'm, I'm confident that that's something that we will be analyzing in the CEQA document um, and, and as well as potentially the feasibility study. Um, Simon, um, I'm sure you can expand on that. Yeah, we'll be doing uh, modeling of ocean at, o oceanographic conditions at the site with and without the island and or causeway in place. So the commission and the public will be given uh, information on what those models tell us about the conditions um, as they would change should the island be removed. Thank you, Simon. Katie, next question. Yes, the next question is from anonymous attendee. Um, sorry, that's uh, no question, just comment. Um, the, uh, the comment is, thank you for the public town hall. It's, it's been wonderful to learn about our local ocean horizon. Um, a one uh, upvote uh, for keeping the island intact uh, for available and available for residents to dive, swim, and enjoy our beautiful Gold Coast. Um, the next question is, again, from anonymous attendee, a local lifelong Ventura surfer here. Um, will stay connected through phase two, but would love to see the complete implementation of the oil piers reef with some of the extra material on Rincon Island. Thank you for that. And make sure you stay engaged with us um, with that comment, please. Katie? Um, yes, the next question is from Joe Phelan. Um, if one option will include leaving part of the island in place, who will be responsible for managing and maintaining the leftover portions of the island? And will this be considered in the feasibility assessment? That's a great question. Um, so if, if only a portion of the island is determined to be um, left intact, um, then, and the commission is determining that other portions of the project should be removed, uh, the commission and the state would be responsible for implementing that decision, including um, the money that would be needed to implement that. Um, so we would be going through a, a state uh, budget process to secure that funding. Um, and will this be considered in the feasibility study? I certainly suspect um, that might be something that we would look at. Um, Simon, do you have anything um, to add to that? No, I think you covered that well. Um, I think, you know, the, uh, obviously the, the alternatives will drive the decision maker on who's the best responsible party for it, including, I assume, you know, if it turns into a, a uh, research station or some other kind of site. I mean, there, there's a wide variety of potential end users we'll be potentially looking for. That's a really excellent point. Um, thank you, Simon. Katie, the next question. The next question is from Dan Riddick. Is state lands entertaining any potential acquisitions of the island and associated assets? Um, well, for better or worse, we actually own them right now. <laughs> so with um, the quick claim um, and the insolvency of our prior lessee, Rincon um, Limited Partnership, Rincon Island Limited Partnership, um, we um, have um, assumed responsibility and uh, essentially legal ownership of the facilities. We always, um, uh, at, on behalf of the state, um, owned the land and are responsible for managing the land underlying the island and the onshore properties. Um, but with um, uh, RILP's uh, quit claim um, and bankruptcy proceedings, we um, took ownership of the um, facilities as well. Next question. The next question is from Michelle Pizzini. Lane mentioned that the wells were plugged to the base of the wells cellars. So was a waiver issued not to cut casings at the mud line or will this also be reviewed as part of phase two? I'm actually going to um, turn first to Lane um, to uh, address the portion of the project that he, uh, of the question he can, and then likely turn it over to Michaela or Seth for further explanation. Okay. Um, Jennifer, Drill Tech drafted and State Land submitted a request to Cal Jim and received approval on that request to, the, the request was to set surface plugs in all the wells as uh, we thought that would be the, the best interest of the public and the environment um, because the wells 
you know, the, 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 they're not going to be cut and recovered to the mud line until the island's removed. And it's going to be several years before the fate of the island is determined. Uh, and secondly, if the island stays, then the wells will likely be converted to classified uh, onshore wells. So as the wells stand right now, they all have mud line plugs put in place per calgium regulations. And they also have surface plugs put in place per calgium regulations. And we also received an additional waiver from CalGym to cut and cap the wells at the base of the well bay rather than cutting them 15 feet or uh, five to 10 feet below current grade. So um, if, if the island's removed, then state lands will be liable to remove the casing from the island surface to the mud line. If the island stays, the wells are likely finished as they sit. Great. Um, anybody on our team um, have anything to add to that? Hi, Jen. Um, I don't have anything to add. I think Lynn covered it really well. Great. Thank you, Michaela. Next question, Katie. Yes, the next question is from anonymous attendee. Have there been any sand movement studies based on the sand movement Sand movement, if the pier or jetty have been removed? Simon, do you wanna take that? Um, as far as we are going to do an active oceanographic study that will look at sand movement should the island and, and or uh, causeway be removed. So we will be modeling that. Um, there was um, sand monitoring, sand movement monitoring at the Seacliff Pier site that was required by state lands and the Coastal Commission for five years following the removal of those piers. And all of that data is also available to us to look at what, if any, potential changes may result. Great. Thanks, Simon. The next question is from anonymous attendee. How far around the island does this property extend for reuse? Um, great question. So the State Lands Commission uh, manages on behalf of the state um, most of the tidelands and submerged lands around the island. Um, so if there is an interest um, by an entity or an individual to lease any portions of those um, tied and submerged lands. Uh, we have an application process um, that you can access through our website. Um, but the, um, as I mentioned earlier, the State Lands Commission in this area does have leasing jurisdiction and management responsibilities for the water covered tied and submerged lands um, around the island and in this general area. Next question, Katie. Um, the next question is from anonymous attendee. If any natural materials are to be removed, can the State Lands Commission require they be repurposed for new reefs? Um, certainly, the, the State Lands Commission um, um, using the best available science and all the relevant and appropriate data will make the most informed decision they can in terms of the ultimate disposition of the island, including any repurposing of the um, uh, infrastructure that was used to create the island. The commission in, in this um, situation, this is a state, essentially state-sponsored project. So this, the commission has ultimate discretion on um, not just um, the ultimate disposition, but again, as the CEQA lead agency uh, determining um, mitigation um, measures for um, potential um, future activities under CEQA, obviously um, assuming it is all consistent with um, the ap applicable local state and federal regulatory requirements and their permitting conditions. Um, so that is um, uh, an option. Again, we're at the very early stages, the beginning stages of the feasibility um, uh, program um, and study. So there's a lot to gather and learn and analyze um, and synthesize. So um, we, we hope as we've been stating through this whole town hall event that you all continue to stay engaged with us so um, we um, can um, really truly understand your perspectives and ideas and concerns. It looks like we had another um, question pop up. Yes, we have one, 
we also have someone um, who raised their hand and they just submitted a question. Um, perhaps we could call on them if you would like to ask it in person. That's, that's um, great. Ray Harmon. Hello, this is Brian Harmon. Hi, Mr. Harmon. Um, we can hear you. Please go ahead with your question. I was wondering uh, when and how much do you plan on putting uh, the island up for lease? Um, that is something that we haven't um, really begun to even think about at this time. We are at the very initial stages of the feasibility study. Um, so we are just in the information data science gathering stage um, and we'll be embarking on a public engagement process, um, again, to gather as much information as we can to analyze and th synthesize. That will all help inform the CEQA analysis, which all together um, with um, additional public engagement and tribal consultation will help inform how the commission decides uh, to um, uh, makes their decision for the ultimate disposition of the island. And only at that point will we have a better um, kind of understanding about whether the island will be reused and will seek leases and, um, for that reuse or um, some other kind of use. Um, so again, we're just at the very beginning stages of this, lots more to uh, talk about and learn. Um, but that's a question that I'm sure we will be answering in a couple of years. <laughs> In a couple of years, that's that's what I heard. Uh, yes. Two years for yes. your next stage, minimum. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Katie, next question, please. Yes. Uh, the next question is a submitted uh, question through the Q and A from Dan Riddick. Will Padre study the removal of the island? causeway and the je uh, rock jetty that ties into the causeway. As I understand, the rock jetty was constructed only to support the causeway. Therefore, if the causeway is removed, the rock jetty should also be removed. Please clarify. Yeah, so I will turn it over to Simon, but also I want to read the second, the next question that came in because maybe you can answer that too. Um, Simon is um, when the island was created. So maybe um, if you know that. <laughs> I or maybe know somebody the, from our team can help um, enlighten me as well. <laughs> I, I should know the year, but I'd have to look it up. Right I should now. know it too. 1958. 1958. Thank you. <laughs> okay. it's, All right. It's as old as I am. <laughs> okay. Um, to answer the question regarding um, the, the study, the state lands lease typically requires, if you are to remove a, a infrastructure that was used for oil and gas development or, or any kind of development on a, a state lands lease, you do have to return it to its original condition. Therefore, we will be looking at complete removal, including the, the rock jet, jetty. Um, I know at least one tetrahedron is in that jetty uh, on the onshore side. Um, so yes, we'll be looking at what the full removal of everything would be. Great, thanks, Simon. Katie, do you see any, oh, we just yes. um, have a new question come up. <laughs> yes, from Jose Vicalo. Uh, during the feasibility study process, whether will there be discussion regarding new uses such as bird nesting sites or in addition to the region's MPA, uh, marine protected areas? So, um, just in terms of the scope, um, the specific scope of everything that could be um, uh, looked at in the feasibility study, this is where these kinds of comments will be most helpful for us. Um, so it's hard to answer this in the abstract right now, but as we go out in through our public engagement plan um, and effort, and as we start gathering information, um, I am sure that we will be addressing these types of um, uh, uses and including the relation of the island to the region's MPAs and the benefit that um, this area provides. So, um, and it will certainly be discussed in the CEQA document. Um, so I, I would um, encourage you um, to continue to engage with us so we don't lose sight of, of some of these questions and thoughts and, and ideas. Um, but I'll also turn it over to Simon if he has anything to add or, or provide um, more clarity on. Um, 
oddly enough, one of our biologists actually asked the same question, why aren't we seeing more nesting activity out on the island? And so that, that is definitely something we will be looking at. Um, we are definitely seeing uh, heavy bird use out there um, throughout even the operational time period. So obviously we'll be looking at that. Um, the MPA question, again, will be part of our outreach to uh, uh, Cal Fish and Wildlife and other organizations that are involved in that network and whether this is a suitable site for something like that will be part of our, our understanding and scope. Next question, Katie. The next question is from Dan Riddick. Does state lands or Padre have information on data on what existed before the rock jetty and causeway were built? And I'm assuming that um, uh, you're referring to kind of biological um, and marine data. Um, I will um, turn it over to Simon um, to outline what information you're aware of so far, but we're always open to receiving more. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I received some very interesting photographs via Cindy Herzog, uh, with, mm -hmm. who's going to be managing our, our work for the state lands, showing the, uh, the point there uh, before the causeway was ever built um, and before Highway 101 was widened. So we, we've got quite a bit of information about the pre-existing conditions in the area, and we'll continue to expand on that as we do our studies. Excellent. Next question, Katie. Yes, the next question is from Maria Quinze. Uh, can you confirm the best contact to stay informed of future milestones with this project? Definitely. So um, our website, um, along with an email address I'll reference in my um, concluding remarks, will be the best way to um, be able to ask us questions um, and stay informed. Uh, we will also be um, reaching out uh, in the near future uh, with um, additional options to engage, particularly through our en public engagement process associated with phase two. Um, so um, that, that's typically how you can stay engaged with us. Um, but I also want to assure everyone that, as I mentioned before, public engagement is a priority for the commission. So we also take responsibility and ownership to make ensuring that we're engaging with you all. And it's our responsibility to do that. So um, just make sure you have our statelands or slc.ca.gov web um, email address not blocked in your email and you will hear from us. Um, next question, Katie. The next question is from anonymous attendee. What is the condition of the onshore land portion of this lease? In two years, is there a possibility that nature will reclaim it? Mm. Um, I am going to turn it over to Lane um, to just talk about the current condition of, of the onshore property and what to expect in the caretaker status um, phase. Whenever we finish up and the caretaker preparation, the onshore leases will essentially be left as a couple of flat parcels of dirt. The, uh, the power will be rolled back to the transformers and uh, water, water as well. So essentially a, a couple flat tracks of dirt with everything removed. Um, there will be, we do know there is some impacted soils on the site from uh, the sampling that we've done and also, you know, Depending on future use, some of the uh, there's a bunch of crushed asphalt on top uh, uh, to create you know weather resistant environment. So just depends on future use if that'll have to be removed or not. That's all part of what Simon will be de determining in the uh, phase two. Great. Um, and in terms of the question about the possibility that nature will reclaim it. Um, you know, I'm not a scientist. Um, I might turn this over to Simon in terms of how um, things evolve in such a short period of time, but I highly doubt that it will reclaim to the extent that will um, uh, dictate, be very narrow our options as we move forward um, under the feasibility study. I just wanna add too that um, we will be um, employing security um, to help monitor and um, maintain both the island on the onshore facility to ensure safety. Simon, do you have anything to add to that second, the second part of that question? 
Yeah, as uh, Lane alluded to, some of the surfaces on the onshore facility are not very conducive to vegetation growth, but some areas obviously will develop some, some native coverage as, as well as non-native. Um, but uh, I, I don't think in the short time period that we're looking at, um, it will be totally uh, changed back to mother nature. Thanks, Simon. And thank you, Lane. Next question, Katie. Next question is from Robert Brenner. Wondering if anyone has made a suggestion to create a desalination plant here in the future. Um, not a formal or serious one, um, but um, like I said earlier, we are just starting the public engagement process. So I'm sure no um, ideas or concepts are off the table. Uh, next question, please. The next question is from Dan Riddick. Will the yellow gate along Breakers Way and the gate to the causeway remain closed and locked until completion of the CEQA? Yes, I believe so. Um, and I, it will be um, remain closed and locked um, unless um, we need or our contractors need to access the island um, until the commission makes an ultimate decision. Um, our goal is to, um, as Lane described, um, keep this, uh, the island and the causeway and caretaker status um, so that we're not spending additional money, state monies, um, public monies, um, uh, inefficiently operating and maintaining the facilities, and most importantly, keeping it safe um, for the public. Um, so that will um, remain closed and locked um, until an ultimate decision is made on the future of the causeway and the island. The next question is from Lou Gonda. Are divers currently allowed to dive off the island? Uh, yes, I believe they are um, consistent with any kind of fish and wildlife, MPA uh, regulations. Simon? Just a, just a clarification there. Around the island, yes. Off, actually getting on the island to go diving, no. <laughs> Great clarification, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. The next question is from Dan Riddick. Will the palm trees be watered on the island until the disposition of the island is determined? Hope so. Um, Lane, do you have, um, is that part of our, is that a portion of the caretaker status plan? The fresh water supply will remain uh, for the island. So it's very possible and easily uh, able to water the palm trees. They don't, they don't take too much water though. Great. Thanks, Lane. Next question, please. Next question is from anonymous attendee. Uh, will the PowerPoint presentation be made available? And can cost and details of the well PNA uh, details by well be made available as well? So um, in regards to the first question, we can make the both, we will make both PowerPoint presentations publicly available on our website. We are also uh, recording this town hall. So, um, and the link to this recording will also be posted on our website in the next couple of days. So you'll be able to access the presentations as well as a recording of the entire town hall, including this question and answer um, portion. Um, in terms of the costs and details of the well plugging and abandonment details, um, uh, we can certainly work on that. Um, we can't provide it tonight, but we will take that back with us and see how best we can make that available in as um, easily readable form as possible. Katie, next question. Yes, the next question is from Ray Harmon. Um, maybe you guys can repave our road that has been used so much by the heavy equipment. Please submit that comment as part of the feasibility and the CEQA um, process. <laughs> um, thank you for that. Currently we have no other hands raised or no other submitted questions. Great, um, thank you everyone. I am just trying to um, bring up my closing remarks. Uh, I really appreciate all the thoughtful um, questions um, and comments, um, and we hope that you stay um, as actively engaged as we move forward. Um, so as I mentioned, we are recording this town hall event um, and we'll place 
the link to the recording along with the PowerPoint presentations and the maps that we were showing um, uh, during the Q&A period on our, our website in the next couple of days. I do want to acknowledge and thank um, our state, our local state and federal agency partners, um, including Ventura County, uh, Fish and Wildlife's Office of Spill Prevention and Response, or as you likely know them, OSPR, CalGEM, the Coastal Commission, and the United States Coast Guard. Um, and finally, as we've been talking about throughout the last um, hour and a half, please be on the lookout for notices from us, um, the State Lands Commission, on additional opportunities to engage and provide your insights, perspectives, and ideas and concerns. Um, this, is, um, this next phase is really founded on robust and meaningful public engagement and tribal consultation. So uh, we really look forward to um, talking with you all and learning um, about your perspectives and hoping to reflect that um, in our feasibility study and our CEQA analysis and as part of the commission's consideration of the ultimate um, disposition of the island and the onshore facilities. So as I mentioned, um, our website is a great way to stay involved. Um, please also feel free to reach out to us. Um, most of our contact information is readily available on our website, um, but we've also established a specific email address uh, for this phase two project um, where you can make comments or ask questions and um, we will be actively monitoring it and getting back to you as soon as we can. The website, or excuse me, the email address is ringcon.phase2 at slc.ca.gov. So that's ringcon, R-I-N-C-O-N dot phase2, um, the number two, not spelled out, at slc.ca.gov. And you can also access um, this information from our website. So with that, um, I, I just wanna thank you for your time um, and the great um, back and forth this evening. Um, please stay healthy and safe and we'll be talking to you all soon.